Hey guys, recording this here on, what is it? Friday the 19th. Maybe you're seeing this on Monday at the latest, but want to let you know we are almost sold out for Founder Comp, sorry, Founder 500 in Austin, Texas here in about a week. Uh, it's going to be an amazing event, 500 B2B SaaS founders. I'm looking at the attendee list. There's almost, um, there's almost 60 founders with more than six, seven million bucks in ARR. It's an incredible group of group. There's over a there's over a hundred, over 150 with more than a million, uh, more than a million revenue. It's an incredible group. You don't want to miss it. Uh, grab your hotel, grab your flight, grab a ticket right now. I'll put the link in the bio, um, in the description here on YouTube. And I think there's only about three tickets left. Okay. About three tickets left. I'd love to see you guys there. Don't be bashful. Grab your ticket now. Hey folks, my guest today is Will Robinson. He's the CEO at Encaptura, a high-growth SaaS platform that helps banks automatically extract important information from documents. Launched 20 years ago in Dallas, Texas, Encaptura helps companies such as Wells Fargo, Frost Bank, and Truist save time and money by using machine learning to process large amounts of data. Will, you ready to take us to the top? Let's do it, Nathan. Thanks for having me on. All right. You don't look like you can't be that old. So this company was founded 20 years ago. How old are you? Yeah, I was not the founder. That's the short answer. Uh, so that's what's funny. This company yeah, started back in 98, actually 24 years now. And I, I joined as CEO about three years ago as part of a big transformation that we had made as a company. The company started as a professional services company that worked and partnered with some legacy automation software companies in our industry. And uh, those software companies would bring us in and we would help sell and implement their software. Um, and over time, we started building our own product internally to kind of fill some gaps in the market. And um, when I joined about three years ago, we made uh, kind of a big decision to pivot away from these legacy guys and focus purely on the product that we had built um, over the previous decade. So I had a really uh, fortunate opportunity to step into a business with a lot of folks who knew uh, what they're doing, knew the market we were selling into. And a lot of it was just kind of reprioritizing, um, you know, uh, how we're going to market, where we focus, uh, making sure we have the right folks on the bus. And, and what was the team size when you joined in 2019, just so we get a sense of the operation? Yeah, it was in the mid 30s, 35, okay. 36, 37 yeah. folks. And, um, you know, it's, um, yeah, we're now up to 75. And, uh, you know, and, and, and look, Nathan, people don't like to talk about this a lot. And, and you know, I don't say this as like, a, um, you know, this is not a badge of honor, but I think transitioning the business was hard. And, you know, um, you know, making sure that we had the right folks here uh, was important. And some folks were just like, Hey, you know what I've been working at, uh, and where you were going, is not, not a fit for me. And so, um, we've had, you know, a lot of change kind of top to bottom in the organization to bring in people that are excited about the vision that we've set and kind of where we're going with our own product. So let's fast forward to the product today, right? So give me a use case. What's an example of a document, a bank would need your software to extract data from? Yeah, great question. So I use the mortgage example a lot because most people have bought a house. But when you go talk to a loan officer about buying a house and applying for a mortgage, they're going to ask you for a copy of your driver's license, um, a, a recent pay stub, probably the last two years of your tax returns. And they're building this financial profile on you to understand how much money do you make and how much of a how, how big of a mortgage can you qualify for. Typically in a bank, there are people in the back office that as you send in those documents, they're manually typing in your data. They're manually reviewing all the data to make sure it's correct, it's accurate. You know that if you say you make eighty thousand dollars a year, your pay stub actually pencils out to an eighty thousand dollar a year income. Our system can come in and automate that entire process. So we use machine learning, make it easy to collect those documents, and once we have them, we can read the documents automatically. We can extract the data. We can do these calculations. We can verify that the data is consistent across all the different documents, so that people don't have to spend and candidly waste a lot of time doing that. Oh, what's going on there, YouTube? Good to see you guys. Now imagine this. You love watching these interviews with SaaS founders, but imagine if we took all of the valuation data out from over 2,807 interviews I've done manually. Saves you a lot of time. Well, we've done this. We've built it into the beautiful interface inside of FounderPath. Check this out. I'll show you how you can access this in a second, but you log in, you connect your Stripe account, you see your valuation real time, you can see what it changed over the past 88 days, and even set goals for valuation this year. 
Now, the secret valuation is there's many different ways to value a SaaS business. So the reason you're going to see three or four different valuations inside of your founder path dashboard, this is all free, by the way, is because depending on who's doing the buying of your SaaS company, you're going to get a different valuation. A VC is going to pay a different valuation. Private equity firm is different. If you're going to do a minority sale, that's different. And if you sell the whole business, that's a different valuation. You can see all those when I hover over here. Right, so the teal is what a VC would pay. Yellow is what private equity. And red is if you sold the whole thing outright. Now, what's cool about this is this is not built off random data. Again, you guys hear these interviews on YouTube. All these data are built from real-time valuation data points founders share with us on the show. So traction, 1.2 million. Seed round, 3.7 raise. They sold 22% of their business. Go in here and filter by the event. Maybe you only want to see companies that have sold the whole business. Well, here are a bunch that have been acquired, the valuation and the multiple. Maybe you're going out right now and you're raising your seed round. Well, go in here and look at all this recent seed deals that went down, what they raised, what valuation they raised at, and what percent that they sold. There's never been a larger data set of SaaS valuations than what you can get now inside of FounderPath, and we're thrilled to bring it to you. All right, we're going to go back to the YouTube video here in a second, but if you want to check this tool out, if you want to jump in and sign up, you can check it out for free to get your valuation at this link, this link, founderpath.com forward slash products forward slash valuations. Or if you go to founderpath.com and hover over products, click on get your valuation here and go ahead and sign up to give it a whirl. Again, all that valuation data live right inside the platform. I hope to see you there. All right, let's jump back into the interview. Power of AI usually is a direct correlation to the power of the, the testing set that was fed the machine in the first place to learn on. So it's really hard sometimes to get your, your you know, a grasp of a large enough testing size to make the AI actually useful. What did you guys use to train the AI in the first place? What was your testing cohort? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, and it's funny. Um, there's standard documents, you know, things like driver's license that are that are very standardized. There's a lot of them. It's easy to get trained up on what we call you know structured content, but documents that come um, in the same format every time. But something like a pay stub, there's a lot of variety in that. Um, the the layout, where the data is, uh, where it's coming from, and so you know we've been able to train on hundreds, if not thousands, of data sets of sample sets to really improve our machine learning. And I'll tell you something else, Nathan, kind of a secret in our world, when people think of machine learning, they think a lot of kind of what they see in commercials, which is unsupervised machine learning, where you just feed massive data sets into a system and then the system naturally gets, you know, understands patterns and gets smarter on its own. We actually employ um, a supervised machine learning technique, which is where uh, we feed data to the system, the system starts to look for patterns and trends. And then we as humans can come in and actually influence the models that we build and help either, you know, affirm certain decisions the, the, the system has made, or we can correct maybe bad errors or assumptions based on what we see in the data as well. Understood. And it, yeah. And so how many on your team of 75 are full-time engineers? We've got probably 25 or 30. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And then I guess, give me a, a sense of sort of how you price. So what is your average customer going to pay to use this technology today? Yeah, so we have these broad, uh, we, we, we price based on the volume of pages, the number of pages or the number of documents that come through our system. So if you think about it, our, the whole value prop of our system is saving you time and money. The more, uh, the more documents that you can run through our system that people don't have to mainly review, uh, the more value you get out of the system. So that's really the, that's really the drivers. We have these broad based buckets of really millions of pages. If you think about it, a lot of these banks are, these are high, high volume situations. And uh, we're pricing it just as a fixed annual fee based on the volume tier you're in. The good news is the more volume you send through the platform, the incrementally cheaper it gets for you as a customer of ours. So we really encourage our customers, hey, send more and more stuff through. Let's let's uh, you know put more lines of business uh, onto our platform and it gets cheaper and that ROI uh, gets a lot stronger. Okay, that's all. Well, I understand that, but then answer my question. So what, what is the sweet spot? Are we talking like $100,000 year contracts or million dollar year contracts or something oh. lower? Yeah, no, it, no, it's uh, yeah, typically hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred thousand 150000 dollars is our starting spot. Uh, we've got several customers spending more than a million dollars a year with us. Okay, and so for someone paying you guys more than a million a year, how many pages are they probably processing? Uh, you know, there it's at least you know it could be 20, 30, 40 million pages a year. 
40 million pages per year. Interesting. Okay, got it. So a million dollars would get you 40 million pages sort of processed per year. That's sort of the right ratio to think about. Your volume pricing is that. Roughly, yeah. Yeah. Um, we've yeah. got guys, yeah. I mean, we've got guys way over a million too. So yeah, it's um it's it's typically, you know, again, um, yeah, it, if you're thinking about it kind of on a per page basis, it gets a lot cheaper the more you can scale with us. Kind of that original that original model training and setup and staff, you know, and kind of the lower volumes, um, you really start to scale as you can layer on more and more volume. Yeah. Yeah. A million divided by 40 million pages. What is that? Like 0.025 cents per page yeah. or something like that. Yeah. It's pretty inexpensive, which is nice. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then, so, so launched in 1998, you join in 2019, 35 and I guess, I want to get a sense of like sort of what you've done at the company, right? Since that's what you're best to be able to speak to. So how many customers was the company working with back when you first joined day one? Yeah, we probably had 15 or 20 on the platform. And now we're at, uh, I think we're going to cross 50 this year. Oh, wow. So uh, help me through that. I mean, signing up banks is not an easy process. That's quite a sales cycle. How did you land, you know, go from 15 to five zero? Yeah, a big part is that process. Like you said, banks are, they, you know, they're conservative uh, organizations, they move slow. The big thing for us is helping, we're not here to actually sell the software to the bank, we're here to help them build a business case for the for the software. So it's really funny, a lot of our competitors will do like 10, 12, 15 demos. Um, we do like one demo or two demos just to like help people be aware of how the thing works. But then we spend a lot of time understanding their business process, understanding the opportunities they have for automation. Um, we have benchmark data that, that we have from other uh, clients of ours where we can say, okay, for this type of loan process, here's where we can save you money. And then we do a big math exercise that says, okay, you have this big of a team. This is how much time is being spent. Here's where we can eliminate or reduce certain tasks. So here's how, here's how much money we can save you every year. And um, it's, it becomes a really powerful sale to, you know, to bankers who are very uh, dollar kind of bottom line numbers driven. Driven. That makes a lot of sense. Now, how have you capitalized the business? Are you guys bootstrapped it or have you raised capital? So we are backed by a by a, a private equity firm here in Dallas. So that's when I came on, bought out the the original um, founders and, and kind of management team. Um, they put a little bit of money in, in the business, but I would say we are running, um, you know, since then we're running kind of more on the conservative scale and kind of organic growth, organic funding. Um, we've been able to grow uh, very capital efficiently through that. And, uh, but I would say in the next year or two, we'll be in a spot where bringing in a new capital partner, uh, we've just got big dreams. There's a huge market here and uh, we have a lot we want to go do. Well, okay. I guess let's talk pre-private equity because I know that obviously the cap table changes drastically when private equity comes in. So pre, pre-private equity, had, had the company raised a bunch of equity, a bunch of capital? No, no it's just been completely bootstrapped by the original founder. Okay. Okay. Got it. So it's bootstrapped by the original founder. He was like, I'm, you know, I'm tired. I'm getting older. I want out, whatever. The private equity firm comes in. Now, is he still on the cap table or the PE firm? Was it a 100% buyout, majority buyout? Yeah, yeah. They bought out 100%. And okay, so okay. he was he was at, he was, he was ready to retire kind of at that stage in life. And, and so it was a good opportunity for him to get liquidity. Um, it was a good opportunity for me to join. Um, I had a prior relationship with these guys. And uh, it was, uh, you know. It was Who was the firm, by the way? Who was the private equity firm? Called Alturist Capital. They're, they're here in Dallas. Great Alturist. Group. Altruist, interesting. And did they line you up before the deal was done? In other words, they weren't going to do the deal until they knew who the CEO was going to be. Yeah, we had partnered together actually, and so I had I had approached them probably a year prior, and I have a background in software and tech. And I said, hey, look, I'd love to go find a small software business that we can grow together. And again, I knew these guys. Um, we were really aligned on kind of how we think about investing and values, and um, and so we kind of came in and did this deal together. And that was a big part of doing the deal was, hey, could I build conviction as the guy stepping in as the CEO? on growing this business and creating a lot of value, um, which we were ultimately able to do. Yeah, interesting. And you said this was the firm, it's a a a l t r u i s t altruist? It's altruist, A-L-T-U-R-U-S. Oh, U-R-U-S, got it, got yeah. it, got it. Very cool. Now, do they have they done this historically a ton, sort of SaaS PE? No, uh, this was one of their first, uh, they've done a couple of technology deals, but this was their first SaaS deal. And so that was my background. and. Uh, you know, they've been super supportive and, you know, it was a good opportunity um, to kind of come in and get them excited about it. And I can tell you now they, they want to do a lot more. Yeah, I was going to say, so obviously the, the motion here usually is organic growth is fine, but inorganic growth is way more interesting. If you're the hub, what are the next six spokes? So how are you thinking about M&A and how much capital do you have at your disposal via Altruist to go do a roll-up strategy? 
Yeah, it's funny. We talk about this a lot. Uh, this is a highly fragmented market. So there is a lot of opportunity for M&A. We have been growing organically so well, like 100% year over year for several years. And so candidly, we don't have time or, or effort and the equity value we're creating through our organic growth is in the time and, uh, that we're able to put into that is worth a lot more than us maybe breaking away from that um, and, and doing M&A. So I think we want to get a little bit bigger um, uh, and really kind of prove out our process because I think a lot of the the value in a roll up is going to be around finding maybe some legacy um, uh, you know, business models that are processing documents either manually or partially manually, being able to bring their clients onto our platform and provide a lot of lift for them. Yeah. And then Will, in terms of sort of scale today, um, I mean, we can sort of estimate based on what you shared with us, right? Five zero customers at a sweet spot of 150K per year. Obviously with a caveat that it sounds like you have some whales in there, right? Some million dollar plus accounts. But if we take 150K a year times 50, that puts you at a minimum of about 7 million in terms of run rate. Is that fair? You guys are north of that at this point? We are north. Yeah, 150 is our minimum. So yeah. um, average deal size, you know, we're, yeah, I'd say we're probably four to 500K average deal size. Oh, got it. So you're much better. I mean, you're you're pushing like 30, 35 million in AR then, something much bigger. No, we're, no, I think, no, we're, we're not that, we're not there yet. Um, okay. Can you break 30 million this year? I would love to. No, it's probably, <laughs> probably 18, 24 months out. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I guess the last question I've got um, before we wrap up with the famous five, you know, a guy like you again, how, how old are you? I'm 35. I'm just guessing, right? You're a young guy, right? So how does a PE firm sort of convince you to come in and do this when you could go, you know what? I'm young. I've got energy. I can just go start my own thing from scratch and own hundred percent. Yeah. I had to convince them actually, Nathan. Um, that was my strategy is, you know, I, it's part of it, like figuring out yourself and kind of what are you good at? And I had done some really early stage stuff or been involved in that. And I felt like I do best in my experience when I have something to start with and grow. Um, and so kind of that zero to one, I was like, Hey, start me at the one and let me take the one to five or the one to 10. And so, you know, that was the model they were comfortable with. I think, you know, they're the type that don't want to do the zero to one. Um, and so we were able to come into this business. We had enough traction. We knew we had product market fit. There was a lot of work to do around kind of repositioning vision and culture and strategy and people and process. But in terms of the the pain we were solving for our customers and having enough traction, we, we felt very confident that that we could do something with this. And when you look at your success so far, the past three years, what was on a percent basis? What's total revenue growth since 2019 up through today? Well, let's see. Inc. The Inc. 5000 came out yesterday, and I think that's a three-year period. And I think we're at 270 percent. So that's probably okay. That's probably close to what it would be. So does this Inc. 5000? You have to. Sh- do you have? Do they publish the revenue figure? No, just the they don't. They- just the percentage. Got it. 270. Got it. Well, look, if you're north of 8 million and south of 30 million, you can sort of back into something, right? But 270% growth is impressive. Um, would you argue that most of that revenue growth has come from adding, again, those new customers? Or is it more from getting the current customers to process more pages per year? I think it's been both. You know, um, One thing we had to validate coming in was um, with our historic model, we hadn't done a good job of going out and finding new customers. We had been relying a lot on these legacy customers from legacy partners to to sell our product and so it was really a two prong approach let's go back to our existing customers and again we we had a, a bunch of r and d to do on the machine learning side to really get the product to where i felt like we needed to go and get full value out of it and so a lot of it was us you know adding these capabilities going back to the existing customers saying hey this is going to provide a ton of value let's you know let's get you guys um, you know spending candidly spending a lot more money with us but doing a lot more with us uh, which resulted in a lot of upsell and then, you know, restarting or really starting from scratch, kind of our, our go to market um, for net new logos. And so it's been, it's been um, a balance. I would say in the early days, it was a lot of working with existing customers while we got our go to market figured out. And now we've got a really nice lead gen engine uh, for new logos. What is lead gen? Where do you get leads from? It's a uh, heavy outbound and heavy event driven. That's been the best for us. And you think about our deal size and you think about who we're selling to, um, there's a very targeted group of people who buy what we, what we sell. Um, and they're not, you know, it's, it's not, it's a very enterprise B2B motion. So we spend a lot of time and effort getting to know people, finding the right people, crafting, uh, very kind of curated messaging towards them. Um, events have been great, especially kind of coming back from over the last year, coming back from COVID people really want to be at, be at these events and, um, see what's out there. So, uh, that's been that's been our strategy so far. We probably need to diversify and will 
but it's um it's one of those if it ain't broke don't fix it kind of situations all right cool let's wrap up here with the famous five number one will what's your favorite business book oh uh, man about six well I'll, I'll take my most recent that i love it's called no ego and it was about how to build high performance teams uh, how to make sure that people are thinking about your business thinking about teams in the right way having a po- positive assumptions about what they do we actually had the whole company read it and uh I don't have favorite business books because I read a ton of them and I feel like I get a lot out of everything. Um, that's the most recent. I will say this. My, the, the most impressionable one I ever read was probably 10 years ago. It's called Servant Leadership. It was written by this guy, Robert Greenleaf, back in the 70s. Uh, he had been a longtime IBM guy and then went to academia and he talked about kind of successful traits of, of servant leaders. That's really been um, probably a core of, of, of how I try to run the business where I'm not the guy at the top. I'm the guy at the bottom. And my whole job is to empower people around me to be successful in what they do. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? I feel, like these days, well I, feel like, I feel like these days it's just what not to do. It's, I won't name names, but uh, it, it's folks you can read about in the paper. Uh, I think that's been my key thing over the last six to nine months is watching kind of spectacular implosions of certain, especially high growth software companies of how not to lay people off, for example, yep. I won't name names. Um, how not to uh, maybe leave your current company and go do a new company. So I'll, I'll nope. leave it at that. I think that's been the most interesting for me is I feel like we got a good thing going here. We got a good, we got a good culture. Um, don't screw it up. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building in capture? Say that one again, online tool, favorite, favorite online tool. Slack, I guess. I mean, it just keeps that's us fun. so connected. No, that's good. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Oh, this is a big one. I get eight to nine. That's good. In situation, uh, married, single kids. Uh, married, two kids, one on the way. So, oh, um, very cool. So three total, girl. like three with the one on the way. Two, uh, uh, three. No, I have two kids and one on the way. So, got it. So three total here shortly. Yeah, that's right. Very cool. And thirty-five years old. Last question: Something you wish you knew when you were twenty. That uh, career paths are not linear. Uh, the mm-hmm. most successful people in the world have very winding, unusual paths and it's okay to hold on to things loosely and just let it happen guys there you have it in capture.com legacy player in the bank space uh, services and software to the banking space launched in 1998 will came in when a private equity firm came in and bought the firm alterus capital bought it in uh, 2019 he came in he since grown at 270 percent the company today is now serving 50 customers at an average price point somewhere between 250k and 500k you know revenue call between sort of 10 and 20 million bucks as he looks to continue to scale um, doing it very efficiently. No outside capital raise since that private equity deal. It was a 100% deal back in 2019. 75 on the team today, 25 engineers, obviously heavy engineering when they're doing machine learning and AI, helping banks process documents faster. Their biggest customers are processing caught 40, 50 million documents per year. Will, thanks for taking us to the top. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at NathanLacka.com forward slash slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right. I'll be in the comments. See ya.